Hello. I'll do an official start in a second, but uh, just wanted to say hey to everybody as you're logging on. We'll get started in a minute or two. And uh, Dan from Kansas and Maxine from Toronto and Susan from Eagle Point, Oregon. Matt from St. Louis, Missouri. Jane from Maine. That rhymes. Uh, Maxine from Toronto. Did I say that already? Um, <laughs> Kate Corcoran from uh, Bay St. Louis. And okay, we got Oregon here, Vancouver, Charlottesville, Fort Worth. Iridale County, North Carolina, Valerie, hey, Williamsburg, Leslie, how you doing? And first to log on was Mildred there from Stanley, New Mexico. Good to meet everyone. Hey, Sandra. So we'll be starting in just a minute. It's just turning one o'clock right now. So I'm just kind of working out a few um, <clears throat> little things here on my screen. And then we'll get started. Oh, Kira from the Czech Republic. Nice. Ocala, Florida, Candace. Cool. It's so great to be back on here. It's been a little while. Tina from Sprague River, Oregon. Cool. All right. So I think I'm going to get started here. Take a sip of water now that it has passed one o'clock. Hey, Leanne from Lincoln. Cool. Yeah. Uh, if some of you are usually would watch us through the Facebook interface. We usually do YouTube and Facebook at the same time, but the Facebook interface isn't working on um on the software that we use at the moment so this uh, at least this works right you never know if it's going to work and not going to work <clears throat> so greetings everyone you are watching herb for live i'm john gallagher from learning herbs and learning herbs you know we have been helping folks make safe and reliable herbal remedies with common ingredients that grow all around them since 2005 and uh with me today on Herb Mentor Live is Rosalie de la Forêt. Rosalie is best-selling author of Wild Remedies as well as Alchemy of Herbs. She is a registered member of the American Herbalist Guild, and she has been with Learning Herbs for like 12, 13 years or so. And, um, and I'm really excited to have her with us today. Rosalie, how are you? Hey, John. Hey, everyone. Right. Happy to be here. So how are things over in Eastern Washington? Oh, we have the most gorgeously blue skies right now and nice. we're expecting lots of rain starting tomorrow. So I'm busy when I'm not here with you, of course, harvesting everything I can out of the garden because we came close to our hard frost tonight, hmm. last night. So it's oh, right. end of garden season here. You guys get frost there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, what are some things in your garden that you're harvesting right now? Well, um, I'm going to harvest the last of the Tulsi today, which I've had a really good harvest of this year. And so I'm excited to kind of get this last little batch in. And um, the marshmallow is really beautiful right now. It's marsh you know, marshmallow plant. It's big. Mm. It's still flowering. So I'm going to let that one go for a little bit, but I am looking forward to getting some roots from the marshmallow this year. And I also have some really beautiful rosemary plants and rosemary doesn't overwinter here like they do where you live, John. So oh, yeah. I'm going to harvest all of the rosemary and dry that for the winter. Um, so I could go on and on. There's so much, <laughs> you know, then there's the tomatoes and the eggplants and the peppers that have to get harvested. So Wow, you're busy. Going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good kind of busy though, you know. It's like definitely that that brisk fall day mm. and you know, it's kind of just got that little nip in the air, but yeah, those blue skies and the birds and squirrels are busy out there with me. So, it's a pretty beautiful way to spend your time. Mm, wonderful. So, um we're today we have a cool little presentation that you put together for us. Um, now, you know, you and I both got our, I think, start and interest in herbal medicine um, through wild foods. Like that mm -hmm. was the primary thing. And one of the, um, you know, the big wild foods that you learn uh, early on is rose hips, you know. And so uh, we're excited to talk about that today. Yeah. yeah. So do you it's have definitely a rose, hip, rose hip season? Yeah. Yeah. Have you been harvesting any or? Not yet. I'm going to wait just a little bit longer for the rose hips oh. around here. And yeah. my favorite rose hips don't really grow around me. It's those Ragosa roses, which I know I'm going to find some um, 
just steps from your house when I'm over there. Um, those are They're still pumping out flowers, though. <laughs> Oh, really? Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, so there's, we're going to talk about it, but there's lots of different rose hips and lots of different times to pick them. So, yeah, yeah. it's a little bit longer before I'm picking them here. Little, yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, well, you're, uh, I mean, even though I'm hosting, you're, you're the one running things here. So, would you like to uh, do a presentation first or take a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's do the presentation if you want to just hit that. Okay, on I'm going to put there. that up on the screen and. Perfect. And I'll remove Perfect. myself and I'll uh, put you on there. Whoops. Excuse me, everyone. Oops. <laughs> 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 I'm uh, figuring this out. <laughs> so let's... There we go. All right. So welcome, everyone. I'm excited to talk about rose hips uh, because I love them so much. And as John was saying, they are such a wonderful food, and they are also a wonderful um, medicine as well. John, you could put me on the screen. I don't mind. I think that's nice if you want to do that. Um, all right. Myths and truths about rose hips. So I came up with this uh, subject because I thought it would be fun. I'm sorry, John. I meant like put me on the side and then put. The I know, I know. I, I, I know. the this software that we use, like they changed yeah. the the the. the... <laughs> Oh, overnight, how, how it all works. So I'm trying to figure it out. Uh -huh. like it used to work a different way. And now I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, what did they do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, whatever's easiest, you know, just at one point you had oh, me, there. like small and then the thing. No. <laughs> you could give the presentation. No. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just put the thing up. That's fine too. I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah. Close. And then how do I stay on with uh get myself off without uh can there we go. Perfect, John. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your patience, everyone. It's just it's buttons, but man, you gotta push those buttons in the right way. All right, so rose tips. So yes, I'm excited to talk about them because I do hear a lot of um urban, like urban myths <laughs> go on about rose tips all the time. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about them. So we're going to clear some of those up today as we talk about the myths and truths of rose hips. First, let's start with what are rose hips? Of course, they come from the rose plant. And this is a wild rose that's growing in my yard. Took this photo this spring. And I was lucky I did so because this is a really good way to look at the different parts of the rose. So we're going to look at these right now. So of course we have the petals right now. It's just the rose bud, but those will unfurl into the petals. Here, are these green parts behind them are the sepals. Then that thing you see there, that little green ball is the inferior ovary of the plant. And that's going to be very important as we're talking about rose hips. And then those are the leaflets there. Okay, so the inferior ovary. When we're talking about rose hips, this is the part that we're talking about. And I found this cool image here where you can see this cross section of a rose hip. And I'm not sure if you can see my, you probably can't see my mouse. Um, but basically I'll walk you through this is that you can see there's the, that green part, that's the kind of fleshy protective covering of that section and then inside you can kind of see those little glistening hairs that little textured piece and we are looking at the inside of the ovary the reproductive part of the rose and then you can see those seeds developing as well so it's kind of this cross section of an unripe or immature rose hip and then of course as the flower gets pollinated then those the ovary begins to swell and you get the rose hips um, begin to form. And the, sometimes in some species, the sepals, definitely the petals fall away. Sometimes the sepals fall away. Sometimes they stay on for a while. And then over time, those rose hips continue to develop and they'll turn from green, they'll start to turn orange. Sometimes they stay orange and sometimes they get to be a beautiful red color. And I put a little arrow in there to show you where the sepals are. 
just to give you a little reference. So in this particular variety, the sepals stayed on. So those are rose hips. They're essentially the fruit of the rose, and it's that um, part that then becomes ripe and forms this, this fleshy fruit. All right, let's dive in to myths. Myth number one. This is a pretty big one. And it's that you should never heat or boil rose hips because it destroys the vitamin C content. So this is kind of like, there's definitely some truths in here, but I think there's a bigger picture for us to consider. So vitamin C, ascorbic acid, amazing stuff, right? It's this wonderful vitamin. It is exceptionally high in rose hips. Rose hips have a much higher content of vitamin C than even oranges, which oranges often get all the credit for vitamin C. There's lots of things that have vitamin C, though, as you see in this picture, things like citrus fruits, kiwi, bell peppers, broccoli, very high in vitamin C. But here's the thing with vitamin C. It is a very unstable vitamin. So, for example, I learned from the book Eating on the Wild Side by Joe Robinson that broccoli, although it's very high in vitamin C, when you pick it, like immediately, if you pick it and eat it very high in vitamin C, if you pick it and then it sits for even just 24 hours, 50% of the vitamin C in that broccoli is gone. So... The point of this is that there's lots of ways to get vitamin C and the freshness of whatever you're eating that has vitamin C in it is very important because vitamin C just breaks down really quickly. So vitamin C breaks down after harvest and it does, it is sensitive to heat and it will break down with heat. So if you're eating rose hips for the sole purpose of getting vitamin C, the best way to do that is to walk to a rose bush, harvest a hip, and eat it. That's the best way. Once you harvest and dry it, it's already lost a lot of its vitamin C content. If you make a hot tea out of it, even if it's just fresh off the bush, bush that is also going to lower that vitamin C content. So the point of this really is to say, yes, you know, if, if vitamin C is the only thing that you're interested in rose hips, definitely get it fresh off the bush, and I wouldn't heat it, etc. But I think the bigger consideration here is that rose hips have so many gifts. They have so many phytonutrients, so many wonderful things in them, that vitamin C is kind of one of many gifts of rose hips. And in my mind, is not like the one way or the one reason that we should eat rose hips. So rose hips, as mentioned, they're high in phytonutrients, phytochemicals including vitamins and minerals. So I mentioned vitamin C, calcium, magnesium, potassium, beta carotene, quercetin, tocopherols like vitamin E, and lycopene. So there's so many wonderful nutrients in rose hip. So even if we eat them when the vitamin C is lowered in the content, there's still lots of reasons that we can enjoy this wonderful fleshy fruit. Here's some examples, and this comes right from our book, Wild Remedies. Studies have shown that regularly eating rose hips can decrease the pain and inflammation associated with osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And again, that is not dependent on how much vitamin C is in there. Another one says one review of the literature stated that because of rose hips' analgesic, that's pain relieving, antiarthritic, anti inflammatory, antioxidative, antioxidative and bone preserving activities, the Rosa genus is a treasure waiting for further exploration by researchers interested in the development of safe and effective antiarthritic agents. So again, lots of benefits to rose hips, not related to vitamin C. Another one, when taken daily in large amounts, like 40 grams per day, and this is dried rose hips, it's a rose hip powder, has been shown to improve blood pressure and plasma cholesterol, thus reducing cardiovascular risk factors. So you can see lots of gifts to rose hips. Yes, they're high in vitamin C. Get them straight off the bush if that's what you're interested in. We can enjoy rose hips in all sorts of ways through our diet, through enjoyable foods, and get benefits like decreased pain, addressing inflammation related to arthritis, and supporting our heart health. 
All right. Next up, myth number two. You should only harvest rose hips after a frost. This is ubiquitous. I think this was like printed in a book and then another book printed it and then all the books printed it. And now like that's just like something I hear all the time that you should only harvest rose hips after a frost. Well, that kind of depends on where you live. So for example, if you live in a warm climate and you barely ever get frosts, obviously you don't want to wait for the frost because the rose hips will probably like dry up and wither before a frost ever comes. And that, of course, there's extremes to that. There can be places where there's hardly ever frosts or frosts just come late. So you have to pay attention to your climate and if that frost thing idea works for your climate. It does for mine. We were just talking like I get frosts pretty early on. And what happens when the rose hips go through a frost is that it makes them just a little bit sweeter. So that's what people like about that. Interestingly, though, if it goes through a lot of frosts, then it will actually decrease in nutrient quality. So if, it, if you live in a place where you can harvest after a frost easily, wait for a frost, but you don't want to wait for like months to go by of them in frosts because they have a lower nutrient value. But there's also something interesting to consider. And I just kind of did a deep dive into this research today because there's been a lot of research looking at when is the best time to harvest rose hips. And from a nutrient perspective, and there's several studies on this, and it's interesting because it kind of depends. That's like everything in herbalism, right? Well, it depends. So if you, again, if you're interested in vitamin C from the rose hips, in the Ragosa rose species, the vitamin C content is actually higher when the rose hip is orange. Just for those of you who pay attention to these things, we are not looking at rose hips of the Ragosa rose variety right now, just a, another type of rose hip, but I, I chose this photo for the orange qualities there. So yes, when Rogosa roses are orange, then they tend to have a higher vitamin C content. When, if you're interested in the lycopene, which has a lot of inflammatory modulating qualities as well, then lycopene is much higher in the rose hips when they have fully turned red and even after a frost. So rose hips, like everything in nature, including us, are never static. They're always changing. So there's really not like a firm line of when you should harvest, when you shouldn't harvest, but rather there's just different considerations. And the closer you work with rose hips, the more you learn how to suss out these different qualities. M myth number three. So you have to de-seed rose hips before you work with them. That is a bit of a myth as well. So the rose hips have this fleshy covering that's pretty thin, and you can kind of see that in the topper part of the top portion of the screen there. That's the flesh of the rose hips. And then inside of that, there's all of these little hairs and the seeds of the rose hips. And if you ate a lot of those hairs and seeds, they can be a little bit irritating. They can be irritating in your mouth and your throat throughout your digestive tract. So it's not really recommended to eat a lot of irritating hairs and seeds. So if you want to actually eat the rose hip, like you want to make something where you're going to be eating the fleshy fruit of it, then you do need to remove those seeds and hairs especially. However, if you're going to be making something where you're going to strain out the rose hips, so for example, you're going to make a tea with the rose hips and then you'll strain out the rose hips before you drink the tea, or a syrup or another type of preparation where you're gonna strain it and you actually aren't gonna eat it, but you're just gonna have the water that's left over. In that case, you don't have to de-seed the rose hips. So it's really, it takes a lot of time and effort and patience to de-seed rose hips. It can be totally worth it if you wanna eat the flesh. I love to de-seed rose hips and then infuse those rose hips, just the fleshy part into honey. Uh, that's one of my favorite things ever. You can make jams, et cetera. They do take time and effort. And a tip for that is that you harvest them and then you freeze them. And then once they're frozen, you can remove them from the freezer, take like a butter knife or another type of knife 
and slice them open. And then when they're, they're frozen on the outside, you can just use a little spoon and scoop out the seeds on the inside. But if you're just going to be using the rose hips for tea or a syrup, or again, something where you're straining it, I would not go through the trouble of removing all of those seeds because like I mentioned, it's, it's a lot of work. All right, myth number four, humans are the only ones who love rose hips. Okay, I'm kind of reaching for this myth, but I wanted to show all of our friends who love rose hips. There's lots of birds like waxwings who love rose hips. Some birds like the waxwings will eat the fleshy fruit. And there's other birds, I believe the finches, uh, who will eat just the seeds. And then there's all sorts of mammals who love to eat rose hips, the deer, the skunk, the beavers, bears, Voles and mice, rabbits, and coyotes, they all love to feast on rose hips. And also related to this discussion in just terms of ecological connections, you could say that beaches love rose hips. So Rugosa rose, often considered an invasive plant, also serves an important function on many beaches here in North America because uh, Rugosa roses can handle the salt spray and being in that environment on a beach. And then they do grow pretty aggressively and they help prevent erosion on, on the beaches. And as mentioned, they are my favorite rose hips because they're like plums. You know, they get so big and they're super fleshy and they're often sweet. So they're a really fun one to eat. My local rose hips tend to be very small uh, in comparison. So I like the Rugosa roses. All right, and now I have the last myth, myth number five. A rose hip is a rose hip is a rose hip, or all rose hips are the same. I might have already been telling you that they aren't <laughs> because I've been mentioning different kinds of rose hips, and that is just very true. Here is a list of some of the species of roses out there. There's over 320 accepted different species of rose, uh, rose hips. I tried to get them all on the screen and I couldn't, but I hope the screen just kind of shows you this look is there's so many different kinds of roses and they have so many different kinds of hips. As I mentioned, you have the big fleshy hips, you have smaller hips, you have hips that keep their sepals for a long time, hips where the sepals uh, are, you know, they fall off pretty quickly. So there's so many different kinds of rose hips. And not all rose hips are the same. So they absolutely have different phytochemicals and phytonutrients in them. They have a different array of vitamins and minerals and nutrients. So just because they're all rose hips does not mean they're the same at all, which in some ways could feel kind of overwhelming. Like, okay, it's one thing to just like learn what rose hips are, um, what their many gifts are and how we work with them. But then you find out like, you know, if you live in Alabama, your rose hips might be different than in, if you lived in Oregon versus if you lived in the UK versus if you live in China. So the rose hips are so different all over the world. So how do we know about rose hips? Like if there's that much to know about rose hips, how do we know? And really the best way is to eat them and to taste them and to start to understand the different flavors behind them because it really is the taste of roses that give us an insight into what they're like. And I bet you all can relate that like reading about a rose hip, you know, there's good stuff to read about a rose hip. There's interesting stuff, there's interesting history, there's botanical facts, there's all sorts of things you can read about a rose hip, but you don't really understand the rose hip until you harvest your rose hips that grow near you. Maybe ones that grow a little bit further out. Or if you're not a harvester, maybe you're buying rose hips where you're tasting like, what does this rose hip taste like? And that's going to vary so much. If they, We know this as people who forage that when you harvest a rose hip at a lower elevation versus a higher elevation, the taste changes. We just, we've already discussed if you harvest before a frost versus after a frost. Then there's harvesting when they're orange versus when they're red and on and on. So there's all these different ways that rose hips can manifest differently. And by using our sense of taste, by using our senses, it's called organoleptics. That's the best way for us to begin to have an understanding of 
the differences in rose hips, right? Because most of us aren't in a lab, like trying to study and research, you know, what rose hips have this much vitamin C or et cetera. So we need to harvest them or if we're buying them, buy them, taste them, experience them. And then of course we can experience them in all sorts of different ways, making all sorts of yummy treats. And once you work more and more with rose hips, you'll be able to see and more accurately taste those differences really well. And you'll have, dif you'll notice different years. I'll be like, oh man, those rose hips of 2021 were incredible. I remember the weather was like this and then the rose hips were like that. And that was a fantastic year. So, and that's a pretty fun thing to recognize that rose hips change so dramatically um, from year to year. And again, where you harvest them, the type of rose hips, et cetera. And so when I talk about tasting and knowing what that means about a rose hip, like you taste it, how do you know? You know, so I, okay, I taste a rose hip. How do you know what that means? Well, you can certainly build that up over decades of experience. And it's, you know, it's basically observation, deductive reasoning, all of that com combined. And we also have an exciting training coming up for you next week, which John's going to tell you more about in a little bit. But this is going to be a really fun live training where we're going to discuss that and experience the different tastes of plants. And I'm going to help propel you forward so it doesn't take you decades of experimentation to figure out what a taste of something means, but we're gonna start tasting stuff right away and having your felt experience and having me guide you through that so you understand what those different tastes mean so that you can automatically start putting that to work for yourself. All right, John. Hey. There you are. Hey. So, so I wore my vitamin C rose hip shirt today. So it looks like I, nice. you know, I have my more orange one. Um, you know what I was thinking? I, I really like that when you're pointing out the the um, rose hips on the showing the roses on the beach because it's like wow if you look at the whole you know colony of of uh, you know community of rose plants it's like uh, it's a protection it's about protection. If we look at the uh, thorns on a rose, it's pro protecting the rose, and you think about all the antioxidants that rose gives us, it's mm -hmm. protecting ourselves. So I, I, off, I think that looking at the ecological uh, place of a, you know, um, role of plants can give us a lot of clues overall in how that's working with us, because after all, we're part of the ecology too. Mm -hmm. So um, I like that sort of the ecological medicine point of view, which is a big part of that of, of your book and wild remedies. It's, it's a big part of it. So thanks for put, bringing that in. And I, I have a question, um, before I, uh, talk about, uh, talk about this, uh, new cool thing we're doing next week. Um, so if I choosing to be lazy as I am, I'm the lazy herbalist, um, to, uh, want some of the nutrient goodness. And I decide to use like a vinegar to extract, rose hips to make rose hip vinegar which is a wonderful mm -hmm. way you know you put that in your salad dressings or anything that you're making um to get that like would that would that vinegar like at different stages um extract different nutrients would i get that lycopene in the vinegar or would i get any vitamin c in the vinegar or am i looking at other types of nutrients in there mm -hmm. yeah so if you used fresh rose hips then I believe that vinegar would extract the vitamin C. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure off the top of my head if vinegar does extract lycopene, but vinegar is very, very, very good at extracting minerals. So any minerals that are in oh, the right. plant will be extracted really well. And then I have to like just suppose that, you know, because when you make rose hip vinegar, it turns such a mm -hmm. beautiful red color from the roses. And so oftentimes that coloring indicates all sorts of antioxidants. So I assume that you must be getting, you know, some antioxidants as well when you make that. And I'm glad you mentioned rose hip vinegar because that is a delicious, Oops. yummy thing. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Teaser. Yeah, it is. Uh, big announcement coming. Yes, rose hip, rose hip vinegar. Uh, yes, that's one of my. Uh, it's, it's just a way that. Um, okay, so like when I lived in a drier, like when I was in the East Coast, where I'd have a drier winter, when I go out and get rose hips. Um, 
I felt like it was more like where you live, where you could get those really tasty winter, you know, frosted, you know, after the frost, love them for that. Um, but then in Western Washington, where it's a lot wetter, we have to go out here and harvest them before it gets too rainy. So we're not getting, mm -hmm. ever getting that kind of rose hip experience like you do. So when I harvest it, um, the rose hips, I, I often choose to make the vinegar because they're just not as yummy, you know, like as far as, you know, doing my own fresh, eating them fresh here. So where I live, I just choose, and that's a way for me to kind of store the rose hips. Um, you know, of course I like the freezing idea. That's a really cool idea. I hadn't thought of that. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. idea. may try that. Cause yeah, where, where I live, they actually tend to be somewhat bitter and the fruit is pretty thin. And that can yeah. vary. So what I do is I'll go out into a landscape and I'll nibble a little bit here, nibble a little bit there, and then find ones like, oh, I like these ones off this bush. They tend to be a little bit more sweeter. Um, so I do that. But where you live with the Rigosa roses, those are the ones I get pretty jealous of because they're so fleshy and delicious. And so well, it really does vary. A lot in the uh, planted a lot in our yard. So we have tons, <laughs> even though we could walk anywhere and get them too. I mean, we all live in the, I live in a sea uh, ocean community. So it's, there's plenty of them, <laughs> all mm -hmm. <laughs> the wild roses, but we'll get to your questions in just a second. Everybody, what I want to do is just uh, talk about the little uh, big announcement, the little big announcement that we have. So I'm going to get mm -hmm. Rosalie a, a break here and um, I'll be back in uh, Rosalie in about uh, 30 seconds or a minute. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to add this to the stream and uh, let's see if I can do full screen layout there. And so I do have an announcement here for everybody and it's very cool. So uh, next week, uh, Ros Rosalie is going to join me right here for a three day training called Getting Results with Herbs. And uh, Rosalie is going to show you how to choose herbs via an ancient skill that's simple to learn. You know, there's something called one solution syndrome where we look for that one single solution for a health issue, such as echinacea for cold or valerian for sleep. It's, it's like going to an herbal vending machine. I like this little graphic I put together a while ago because it's like, hey, you have an infection? Take your echinacea. You have a fever? You know, take the yara of can't sleep? Take the valerian. Um, so you end up trapped in that list of herbs and ailments. And this leads to, I think, more confusion than anything because it creates these doubts and makes it really hard to have confidence when choosing herbs because things don't always work that way with their, when you're looking at things in that one solution syndrome way. So if you're ready to trust the herbs you choose, I hope you'll join us. And the first class is going to be next Thursday. So this is going to be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, September 23rd to the 25th, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, which is 2 p.m. Mountain all the way to 4 p.m. Eastern. And um, and if you can't make these live classes, there's no problem. You can watch the replays. We're going to post the replays every day because we know not everyone can make it live if you're in a different time zone or if you're working or something during that time. So the uh, first day is going to be about uh, talking about your herbal type. What's your herbal type? We're getting into energetics here. Okay, you run hot or cold or damp or dry. Second day, we're going to talk about avoiding common mistakes with herbs, the common mistakes people make. And then on the third day, we're going to talk about your blueprint to herbal success using the herbal flavor wheel. All right. So, and when you register, which I'm going to give everyone here the URL before anyone else, because we're not starting to tell people about this to next Monday or Tuesday, but for Herb Mentor members here, we just want you to get an opportunity to get in on a little early. You're going to get, you can download this uh, flavor wheel. And also, because the first day we're going to do the herbal type quiz, and that's part of the packet too. And all you have to do to be part of this is just simply open up another web browser, type in herbalwheel.com, just herbalwheel.com, register. It is free. All right. So... I hope you all can join us for that. So I'm going to put that on the screen there that you can sign up now at herbalwheel.com. And for bringing Rosalie back here, I just want to show everyone that Rosalie's coming right here. She's going to 
across the waters, go across the mountains and the waters into Western Washington and uh, come right here. And I have it all set up for her. I have the cameras and the lights and I've got the herbal, the giant herbal flavor wheel <laughs> uh, that she's gonna teach from uh, right here on the wall. And I'm very excited. And if you just go to herbalwheel.com, you can uh, join us. And um, I'll also be emailing everyone on our uh, lists next week to tell you about this as well. But I just thought you might, you know, want to get a little head start on everybody um, for joining us for that. So very excited for that. And we're going to get to Q&A and we're going to do questions and answers and, uh, and all kinds of fun stuff right now. And, um, and if you have any questions about uh, this as well. All right. And, uh, and this year, we're also going to be, and I'll tell you a call because you're Herb Mentor folks, is we're going to be, we have a brand new uh, course Rosalie's going to be doing. And, uh, but it all starts with these free, these free three days. Um, and it's <laughs> just a couple of hours and, uh, we're going to be here together. Like I said, in the studio, having a good time and answering your questions and giving cool presentations on, um, on herbs and their tastes. So you excited, Rosalie? Oh, I'm so excited. I love the drive over. It's so beautiful. And mm -hmm. you all have a really great yarn store over there. So we do. Yeah. <laughs> so I get you know, like beautiful drive across mountains and water, yarn store, and we get to talk about herbs a lot. So win, 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 win. Exactly, exactly. So um, thank you for that presentation on rose hips. That was awesome. And now it's time for some questions. And um, the first one here from Elizabeth and wants to know if um, if you don't know the type of plant, should you avoid the rose hips? Are all rose hips beneficial? All rose hips are edible. And as I mentioned, they all have varying amounts of phytochemicals. And so they're going to be a little bit different, but all of them are going to be um, beneficial. The only ones you'd want to have cautious uh, or some caution around is if the rose hips are sprayed with something. So if they're sprayed with some type of any type of chemical for, you know, like mainly for pests and stuff, then you want to avoid those. Um, I guess not just for pests, but also depending like if they're in someone's yard, you want to make sure they weren't sprayed for pests. Um, and then if you're harvesting out um, in a more feral or wild place, you want to harvest, you know, kind of basic foraging I, concepts. You don't want to harvest near roads and that could be sprayed with all manner of things too. So that's really, it's just, it's kind of like human caused um, toxicity really, but the rose hips themselves, all rose hips are edible, um, beneficial, lovely. They aren't all palatable. So I will say that we kind of hinted at that some rose hips are going to be sweet. They often have a sour component and some are just like they're bitter and astringent and they don't have that taste, which is like John was saying, his, some of his rose hips don't have the most wonderful taste. And so he makes vinegar out of them because then he gets great nutrients from the vinegar, but he's not relying on them being sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, let's see. And, not a whole lot of questions in here, so but I do want to just mention that it's not just about rose hips. You may have other herbal questions or things. This is uh, this is an herb mentor live, which means it's a Q and A for you, the herb mentor member. And um, we do these every two, three months or so randomly, and we um, come on in live. And remember that you always have the herb mentor forum to go and ask questions to uh, as well. So um, that's a good place for that. And so. Um, I know you probably touched on this a bit, but, uh, well, there's a few questions here. Is this only for, uh, wild roses? Cause you know, like we're talking about Rogosa, which, you know, versus mm -hmm. like, you know, ones I'm planting versus ones that are wild roses. And so, mm -hmm. so that's the question from Kimberly. I do have a preference for wild roses cause often, you know, they're in their wild state. And so they have typically have lots more nutrients in them. But if you have a domesticated rose growing in your yard or friend's yard and it produces yummy hips, then mm -hmm. definitely those are fine too. And that can be a fun thing again about the tasting. You know, if, if you taste rose hip and it just doesn't taste like anything, just kind of tastes bland, then that's an indication that it doesn't have as much, um, you know, phytonutrients in it as something like a wild rose that might have much stronger tastes in terms of being sour and even bitter or sweet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, are there uh, are there any types of rose hips that are toxic? No, um, unless humans have made them so by spraying them with something, but all rose hips are edible. Cool. 
And um, what's the best way to make tea with rosehip powder? That's very difficult uh, because, well, here's what me. So if you want to strain off the powder when you drink the tea, it's very difficult because powder is just difficult to remove from tea. But then also the rose hips have this demulcent quality to it. So it gets like pretty like spludgy. <laughs> That's a, a good descriptive word that probably does not exist. Uh, but it, it's just very difficult. So if you wanted to just like put rose hip powder in water and stir it in there and then drink that, then you could do it like that. There's also other fun things you can do with rose hip powder on the Learning Herbs blog. I think it was last year, maybe the year before. Can't remember now, but I did a spiced rose hip cake. And so basically you're making a delicious cake with lots of rose hip powder in it. So you can also take rose hip powder and add it to smoothies or, you know, put it on things like your oatmeal. So there's other things you can do with rose hip powder. But I would, yeah, I'd play around with the tea. Some people don't like to have like powder in their tea. Uh, so they might not want that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you think that straining it isn't that hard, but it does get pretty spludgy, I think is the word I use. <laughs> hmm. Do you have to, har do you harvest them if they have black splotchy spots? Do they get <laughs> spludgy? Yeah. So it's kind of like if they have a lot of black spots on it and they just don't really look that great, then they are probably too old. They probably, you know, it'd be better to harvest them earlier. If you were like really wanting to use rose hips and you found some and there was like one black spot that you could just kind of cut out and use the rest of it, then you could do that. Um, but ideally, you know, we want our, if we are, you know, if we're, if we're starving and we need them to eat, we might be a little bit more like harvesting them when they aren't exactly perfect. But if we have a little bit more say in the matter, harvesting them for pleasure, then I would look for ones that are visually appealing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how about, uh, did that one already? I meant to click on, do rose hips have phytoestrogenic properties? Sarah asks. Not, yeah, not that I know of, but I could be wrong on that, but it, it's not something that, you know, springs to mind. Mm -hmm. Would it be beneficial to make a tincture of rose hips? So rose hip tincture can be quite yummy. Um, I have done that and added like honey to it and had like a rose hip um, elixir kind of thing. And it can be a nice like after dinner beverage um, or using it as a tincture. The thing about it, like for me, I think of rose hips as being really nutritive. And so they have all sorts of wonderful things in them. And alcohol doesn't extract vitamins and minerals. So you aren't really getting a lot of those nutrients. The alcohol does take the red, you know, we'll take on the red colors. There must be some antioxidants and stuff there. Um, the other thing with rose tips is that we do tend to have them in fairly large amounts for medicinal purposes. So I shared, for example, that for heart health, the study that was done, they used 40 grams of roses, rose hips in order to see that benefit with the heart. That would be a lot of tincture alcohol to drink if you were like trying to get that same result. So it kind of depends on your intentions. Like, again, I've made rose hip tincture, added honey to it, and then used it as a yummy beverage in a way to get, you know, these phyto, um, like this, to get the like essence of rose basically. But in terms of like strict medicine, I think it'd be better to use something where you're getting a larger dosage. So depends on your intentions and, and why you're wanting to work with rose hips. If you're wanting to just, you know, experiment and play with rose hips, then I think it's worth making a tincture and seeing what you think of it. And um, there's always that, that stage of learning, which never ends, right? But we're trying mm -hmm. different things, seeing what works for us. So you could certainly give it a try and see what you think. Hmm. Thank you. So Tiffany asks, uh, how long does it take to dry them? Is it better to dry active slash passive so active passive i guess active meaning like okay. on a dehydrator. A dehydrator or something yeah so that depends on where you live i live in a super arid environment so i have found over the years that my drying instructions don't really help out people who live in a humid climate so with rose hips sometimes people do cut them in half to dry them um, and then a dehydrator is probably a good way to go unless you live in a super arid climate <laughs> kimberly and i um, first got married, we lived in like this 30 foot RV 
of these eagles land. So, and we live in this wet area. So we had this, like one of those like plug in thing, dehydrators, like that you could fit in a tiny countertop. We just keep stuffing nettles and stuffing stuff. Hey, it works. <laughs> When you're stuffing all those little cabinets full of herbs. And then we had kids and then we're like, ah, maybe we need to live in a house now. You know, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I just bought, uh, Lori just bought some dried rose hips from Mountain Rose to make tea with. She has arthritis. So she's wondering how much uh, tea to use when it's already dried. No, it's where it's related to arthritis though. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Yeah, let me just sit with that for a second. Just to make tea with arthritis. So when so again, when we use when we're working with rose hips, it's generally in those larger quantities. So for example, with the heart health, that was 40 grams by weight, and that was ingested. So how much you will need to have some results with arthritis is gonna vary because everyone is unique. And also the tea isn't often what they're using for these research. So, but I, what I would do is I would just start with an amount. And this is kind of a general rule with herbalism is we start with a small amount, see how our body reacts to that. Is your body like, yeah, that's so yummy. I want more of that. It feels so good. And try a little bit more, see how it goes. And at some point you might find like, oh, you know, I'm drinking this amount and I've noticed that I have more flexibility in my joints or, you know, I'm noticing less pain and I feel really good about that. And you can stop at that level or maybe um, sometimes what happens is we like have so much of it and then we get like a adverse effect, right? We, whatever, usually it's like our tummy doesn't feel great about it. So at that point, if you're like, yeah, my body is just saying no, that's enough there. So that's how you find out how much um, that you're looking for. Uh, depending on what kind you got from Mountain Rose Herbs, what I like to do is, this is like probably my most used way to work with rose hips is for Mountain Rose Herbs, I like to get their rose hips that don't have any seeds. So it's like all these little chunks of the rose hip flesh that are dried. So it's all these little rose hip pieces, no seeds. And I like to work with those because it's fun to eat them. And so mm -hmm. I'll hydrate them. I often hydrate them with like apple juice. Um, add them to all sorts of fun things. I often put them in my cranberry compote uh, this time of year when the cranberries start becoming ready. As, as I mentioned, you can just put them, oh, the other day I rehydrated them with apple juice and then I put them in a bread. I cook them into a bread. You can put them into your oatmeal, morning cereals. Um, there's, I like to make rose hip chia seed pudding. So that's another way it's like you actually get to eat all of it and you get, you know, this large amount and you aren't just relying solely like on a tea, which is just what the water will extract, but you're relying on your amazing digestive system to get lots of goodies from the rose hips. So that's kind of my favorite. So if you happen to buy those ones that don't have the seeds in them, then that's a good way to go. Cool. And the other thing I would mention too with rose hip tea which would be an interesting experiment for everyone to do is if you have whole rose hips and you want to make a tea with them, try making a tea where you just infuse it for maybe you infuse the rose hips for 10 minutes, up to 20 minutes. I don't know. Just play with the steeping times and see what that tastes like. And then try the same amount and the same amount of water and simmer it on the stove and taste the difference between those two. We're going to talk about that a lot with getting results with herbs. But I think you'll notice a big difference between just the tea and simmering it. And I think you'll pull out some interesting results from that. Hmm. Uh, it's better to tincture, tincture with dried or fresh? Um, because the rose hips are not one that I have a lot of experience with as tinctures because I really yeah. prefer them in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I can't really say like one is definitely better than the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would try both. Uh, fresh could be good. Dried could be good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And this question was, it's kind of, you've been talking about, you know, is powder good form and how do you recommend tea, food, capsules, tinctures? I mean, I, I, I kind of think um, when learning about herbs, um, you know, try, try, all, try it all, you know, like tr try the tea, try eating them. Um, I don't know about capsules for, you know, I mean, because think about capsules, it's not like against herbal capsules or anything, but if you're trying to learn 
taste like herbs through their taste, you're not going to do that in capsules. So, um, in tinctures, you could try and see what that tastes like or, or, or what that might help you with. Um, but I will um, warn you though, a, a tincture using an alcohol extract, using the powder is going to be very difficult to strain. Yeah, very difficult to strain. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, but personally with rose hips, I mean, you know, syrups and, uh, jellies and vinegar and those are those, you know, teas, those are the most fun. So, um, all right. So what are the, uh, um, let's see, Sim similarly, uh, varying ways to prepare rose hips in order to get the various phytonutrients. So you mentioned vinegar, great for minerals and what infusion, that's one we haven't talked really about. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so the longer infusion or a decoction, again, I think doing that and tasting the difference will be a good um, thing to try out. And then really, for me, rose hips is all about the food. And mm -hmm. so, you know, making the rose hip syrup was so delicious, rose hip jam, rose hip infused in honey, uh, doing things like I saw John has been putting the links in there. There's the rose hip cake, rose hip um, pudding. So lots, of, there's just so many ways to incorporate rose hips into food. And what I like about that is that when rose hips are, you can really make them delicious and then they become a part of your food then they become a part of your traditions. Like I mentioned, the cranberry rose hip compote. I've been making that for like a decade. And um, when we have Thanksgiving, I'm always in charge of that. And that's like, you know, especially for the kids in my life that they have been eating that their entire lives. It's like for them cranberry sauce on Thanksgiving doesn't exist without rose hips in it. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes a part of traditions and a part of your life and something you can look forward to. And again, with rose hips, because we do tend to have them in larger amounts because it's a food like plant, then we get to, when we bring it in our food, we do get it in larger amounts. We can just imagine like if you take like a half cup of those rose hips and make them into a food that's really different than having a tincture and like having like three drops of a tincture, right? I mean, just, mm -hmm. you can just kind of see that difference. That's a really big difference in terms of how much we're getting. So I really like the food aspect of it. I, um, been seeing some people having some difficulties, um, registering. And I thought since we're hanging out here, I might as well just, uh, let me show you here. Some of you folks here, it's pretty easy. Um, I'm going to share my screen because that's always the easiest way to do it. Let's find the right window for that. So when you go to herbalwheel.com, um, again, herbalwheel.com, let's see if I can uh, put that on the screen again, this, right? You see this screen right here, and then you click on uh, any of these orange buttons that say register right now, right? And after you do that, you will see, uh, you click on it and you see this place and you just put your email in. After you put your email in, it'll lead you to this page and it'll tell you what to do. There's some couple few steps here. Click to download the wheel here and you see the whole schedule and where to watch everything. And you can get uh, text reminders or add things to your calendar. Um, so just wanted to share that screen with you there and, um, at herbalwheel.com. And that's, uh, that's my, um, clear up some confusion in people for people. Um, so, uh, let's see, there was a question on how do you make rose hip powder and powders, um, you know, for the most part, unless you have, uh, you know, mills, a mill in your, uh, house, um, you know, usually that's something you're purchasing as a powder. Yeah. I'm not sure if you could, like, I have a spice grinder that I do a lot of stuff in, but I can't say that I've ever tried to do rose hips in there. So I don't know if it's strong enough. Yeah. And you have to, small, like, I, mean, think the amount you need. I mean, you did to take the, I mean, you probably need to take the seeds out. I'm guessing, or maybe not. Yeah. I guess I, yeah. So I was assuming that you would start with the, like the non seed dried rose yeah. hips. But yeah. If you, if you started with like rose hips that you harvested and then you like seeded them, which is very time intensive and then powdered them. I mean, if you have a lot of time on your hands, that could be a good way to go because then you get to be actively involved. But that does really take a lot of time. Work. Just buy the powder and just enjoy, <laughs> make fun recipes with the ones you harvest. <laughs> don't, don't do it. <laughs> no, we, no reason to torture yourself. Um, and do you cut them when infusing in vinegar or honey. 
So for vinegar, I leave them whole. <laughs> for honey, you do need to de-seed them. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Good so question. Honey, yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. And it's really nice to do to make a honey. And then and then when you're deseeding them and they're in the honey, you're you don't strain it later. You can eat, yeah, eat all with the rose hips in it. So it's hard. Yeah. So that's just that is time treat. intensive, but I have to say that is an incredible treat. And it is absolutely delicious. And um it can ferment because there can be a lot of moisture in the rose hip flesh. So um if that bothers you, like some people aren't bothered by wild fermentations and they'll eat it up if if that seems kind of weird to you, you can keep it in the fridge. It'll um, stop that from happening. Rose hit mead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually had rose petal mead um, this year and um, it was fantastic. And then I went to my favorite meadery in town and I said, because their mead just is so good, you know, like better than this other mead that had the rose. I'm not, not revealing who they were, so I'm not criticizing. Uh, and I said, you all, and they have all these rose bushes in their, in their field, right at the meadery. And I was like, have you thought about putting the rose petals and making mead with rose petals? And I'm like, no, I'm like, come on, make a special <laughs> batch for me. It'll be good. Um, <laughs> let's see. Can you do a double extraction of rose hips? I don't, know what I don't think it would be necessary. It's something you can play with, but I, I just don't think it's necessary. Generally, that double extraction is reserved for things like hard polypore mushrooms, like reishi, that are just like very difficult to extract. Roses are not something that's really difficult to extract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see. So, so some people having some difficulty with the registration again thing. Um, you'll didn't download it. It should like just tap on it. It'll probably pop up. I don't know. All these phones are different. Everything always works best on a computer, but it does work on a phone. We've tested it all. It just can't guarantee what phone you have or whatever. But um, if you're on that page where you download it, it'll be in there. Um, I did buy the rose hips without seeds they are yummy thank you so much you can try the chia seed pudding tomorrow excellent lori thanks for sharing nice, that lori. and uh what is good to combine with rose hips is there anything it shouldn't be combined with generally like there's nothing dangerous to combine with rose hips so i don't really know what that would be kind of like from a taste thing you know like most of us don't put mustard in coffee not because it's like bad but because like so there might be something out there like that that's not immediately coming to mind but roses are a great food and so anything that goes well with sour um or whatever you know sour and sweet which rose hips tend to be will be good um i love rose hips like the spiced cake and put lots of spices in there you know your ginger your cinnamon so that can be yummy um as mentioned i do the cranberry compote and there I put in the rose hips and cranberry ginger cloves uh so oh and apples go in there oh apples and rose hips that's a really mm -hmm. nice combination um yeah there I feel like there's so many possibilities it's hard to, to list them mm -hmm. really just because I'm like what wouldn't go with rose hips yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah right right it is one of those herbs that goes with so many things uh, better to with the rugosa is it better to cut them in half before you dry them it could be because, you know, sometimes those are pretty thickly fleshed. And so that can help with the drying process. And definitely on those ones, you know, a dehydrator or sometimes I've seen people put them in the stove, but you have to be able to put your stove really low because um, you don't want to, you're not trying to cook them, right? You're just trying to get rid of their water content. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, cutting in half can help. Back and listen to this presentation. Yeah, the same link that you're watching it on right now. Well, it'll be up there. We keep it up uh, just on the public YouTube um, for you to make it easy to go back to. Um, speaking of meat, hey, that's a good idea. Do how to like? I should get back. I need to get back to making alcohol again. That's just so, you know. <laughs> it's just like a few years ago, I started drinking, stopped drinking so much. So I, I, I wasn't drinking a lot, but I. <laughs> I was just drunk all the time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just found out drinking much at all. So I just was like, uh, it isn't, you know, I just wasn't making um, my usual elderberry wine and my 
things, but uh, that could be fun to go back and 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 go. I may I have made meat a, a few times, and um, it would be fun to go back and do that. That's a great idea. So, not an herb question that Lori asked, but are you a knitter or a crocheter? I love the fiber arts. I am somewhat obsed um, obsessed with knitting, actually, Lori. I just finished this um, pullover. It's the Felix pullover last week, I think, and. Um, yeah, I mentioned I'm pretty excited to go to Port Townsend for the, uh, the yarn store over there. So last year I found this really cool yarn while I was over there um, and we were doing a live thing together and I was able to knit up a, a scarf in the time that I was there. So it was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, we could just spend the rest of the time talking about knitting, but. Yeah. <laughs> so like, Ros Rosalie, Rosalie. Uh -uh. Thanks, Kennedy <laughs> twins. <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> appreciate that um oh boy um so yeah i mean last year R rosalie you were you just i mean you've been knitting for like a year ish a little over a year and you came here and you um knit a whole scarf in the evenings while you were doing the getting results with herbs presentation so by the end mm -hmm. of it you had a finished scarf was it Did i have that right yeah now? yeah yeah that's yeah. what happened yeah. yeah now i've been knitting a, two, a whole two years so who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder <laughs> if you'll share some of your wardrobe with us, um, you know, different days on that. Because we have three days. That's three sweaters. Three days. Well, pressure. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Tiffany asks, is it like Hawthorne where you can increase the benefits by combining different parts, you know, or are the leaflets equals good, nutritive, or just petals and hips? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is an excellent question, Tiffany. And it wouldn't surprise me if you could do that. I do like to combine the hips and rose petals, for example, like in elixirs um, and a shrub. A shrub is when you use vinegar and honey. So mm -hmm. I'll put like rose hips and rose petals into a shrub together. So I like doing that. I don't know of any like studies confirming that the way we do have with Hawthorne, but it wouldn't surprise me because there, there's a lot of you know, the studies that do show like combining of whole plant parts together, they often do show that benefit. So I think that's worth, worth trying out for sure. Um, mm. The peoples, I don't know that there's really a lot in there necessarily, um, but the leaves, I don't really work with them as medicine, but they were traditionally worked with as medicine. So that could be something else to play around with too. Great. Great. And uh Yeah. Baked apples and rose hip honey. Mm. Yeah. Even rhymes. Yeah. Um, Something I like to do is I'll roast apples and the rehydrated rose hips together. Um, add a little bit of honey if it needs a tiny bit of sweetness and then add spices like cinnamon and cloves. Mm. Yummy. Um, let's see. The Tinker's wife apples are in the rose family and most hips I've tasted are very reminiscent of roses. So using them together makes good sense. And uh, yeah. let's see, Blonde Genius Bear says that would be great. An elderberry wine <laughs> would be awesome too. So there is an elderberry wine video on Herb Mentor. So when you go in there, just type in elderberry wine in the searchy thing and um, it should show up. It's a video that I did a while ago, but it does show my recipe uh, step by step. So, and it's a good recipe. Uh, definitely do that. I've uh, definitely, I say speaking of alcohol, it's nearly black walnut season. Yes. Come to my yard. It drops about early November before uh, before I clean them all up because I got one giant black walnut tree, which is rare in the mm -hmm. Northwest. But uh, I live in a town where people planted a lot of deciduous trees because this is a old Victorian town. That, so we have some interesting trees that aren't a lot in a lot of other places in Western Washington. So um, if anyone needs any uh, walnuts and you want to clean up my yard, just let me know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, yes, let's see here. Okay. Apologies for, da, 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 da. um, cool. All right. So I think, uh, we're just about at the point where I don't see any more questions here. Um, and, uh, I just like to remind everybody to go on over to, um, the, I got the little thing on there in my screen there to herbalwheel.com and sign on up. 
Uh, you can do that right after you get off here. If uh, you know, if you're on a phone, it could be confusing. Uh, and you can just sign up, and we'll and it'll give you the schedule and mark. Your, you know, it'll little thing you can click, and it'll add it to your 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 um what do you call it your your computer calendar or your phone calendar and it'll give you little reminders put it on there for you you can even get text message reminders um we're going to be hanging out in right here uh next week and i hope you can join us for that it'd be a lot of fun well we look forward to this uh rosalie and i because as we get to hang out for a few days and we get to hang out with you for a few days so uh I'm jennifer sorry, you has a question but she didn't ask it <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'm giving you a hard time, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um Thank you so much. Unless we get Jennifer's question in here in a second, we will probably I did see up. Sarah had a question about rose hips good for healing mm -hmm. digestion. I could definitely see oh, some qualities right. of rose hips. Like they can be demulcent, which is lovely for healing mucous membranes. They can be slightly astringent, which can which can tighten and tone mucosal membranes, which could help them. So I could definitely see some aspects of that. They probably, you know, if somebody, if I was being interviewed and somebody said, what are your top five herbs for digestion? Rose hips would probably not make that list. Uh, but I think sometimes we get intuitive hits for ourselves, you know, like we're thinking like, oh, I have some digestive problems. And we hear about a plant. We think like we just know intuitively that that might help us out. So if that's the case, go ahead and try it and see what you think. Mm. I did find Jennifer's question here. Um, she was asking, uh, how do you know when they're ready to pick because it's colder earlier up here in South Central Alaska? Mm -hmm. Give them a taste, see what they taste like. And if they have a pleasing sweet, sweet taste, if they're red, if they look good, you know, like they aren't black and splotchy or mm -hmm. old, filled with wormholes or whatever, then, then they're probably gonna be good. And I bet they're probably good around right now. Or pretty soon. I'm not sure. I haven't been to Alaska. I'm just basing that on my own experience and <laughs> zone four here. So, well, Rosalie, I'm excited to get back to uh, live event season here. We, you know, mostly been off here in the summer. Well, you've been doing a lot, but over here at Learning Herbs, we haven't been doing too much. Um, and so that starts next week, where people are going to have opportunity to learn for you for a couple of months, learning this whole taste thing. But it starts next week for. Uh, with the three days. And like I said, you can uh, just come for, you can, if you can't make the lives, there's replays, or if you can watch one and do the others and replays, or it doesn't matter. Uh, you can come on and watch some of them and uh, it's, it's, it's going to be fun. So, but when you, the benefit of getting on live, of course, is that you get to ask questions like you did today. Um, it goes, you're all our mentor members watching this. Uh, so, um, you know, it goes great. What, what we're going to talk about goes really good with Herb Mentor because you're going to have all those extra resources on Herb Mentor. You have the all of Rosalie's monographs. You have uh, the forum to ask questions. You have so much there and so many, um, you know, great input and things. Like you could go, for example, if like this has really inspired you about rose hips, go on Herb Mentor, put rose, rose petals, rose hips in the search bar. Uh, go over to the herbs monographs. Uh, go to the plant walks. What do some other herbalists on the plant walks say about rose hips? There's lots of really cool stuff out there. Um, and there's other recipes and videos and things that if you want to dive deeper into rose hips, you always have Herb Mentor there as like your, you know, reference guide, place for a little inspiration. That's how you use it. You know, you're never going to learn everything on that site. That's impossible. It's like thinking you're going to log into Netflix and watch every movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's there for you just to help you on this fun meandering journey of herbalism. <laughs> that we, that, that not only are we taking you on that we're on ourselves <laughs> that never ends that uh, Rosalita and I've been on for around probably 20 years each and um, it never ends. So um, we thank you for all the wonderful questions and love the comments. Thanks, Claire, for your feedback. And thanks, Marit, for, uh, for saying that you love Herb Mentor. We put our hearts into it. We're always adding new stuff and um, new courses, new things. Um, yeah. So, Rosalie, I'm going to uh, leave the last words to you. All right. Well, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. 
I definitely want to end with rose hips. If you're excited to work with them, I, I would choose something simple. Uh, maybe something today piqued your interest. Uh, rose hip chia seed pudding, rose hip vinegar. Maybe you want to learn how to ID them better. Maybe find them where they grow around you. Just I would choose one simple thing about rose hips that you've never done before, or maybe something you want to get back to and go for it and experience rose hips. And of course, every little ex experience we have, and we just to keep building and building on it, but it just starts with that one little step. So I would do that. And I would love to hear you know, what you're inspired to do uh, with rose hips in the forum. So uh, do something, make something, find something, and then tell us about it in the forums. Yes. And thanks very much, everyone, today. And we'll see you next time. And we'll see you next week on Getting Results with Herbs at HerbalWheel.com. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>